my talk is basically about my career path. Uh, I've been in a lot of different companies over the years. Um, so I just wanted to share and I thought it would be useful for people to see the kind of path that I've been through. And um, I also co-founded a studio called Silent Games and we've just recently got inv investment. And um, we've just been on a big hiring drive and our team is 13 people now. So yeah, I wanted to talk about building that studio and pretty much everything that led up to that point. Cause uh, yeah, I thought that might be useful, especially for people who are um, aspiring to build their own studios as well because it's not easy, an easy thing to do um, but yeah the agenda basically is split in two so the first bit is about building knowledge so my um, university choices that I made because I know that a lot of people will either have just finished university or will be at university right now or wondering if they should go to university at all that's totally valid so I'll talk a little bit about that um, and then my career and how I got a job in the first place and then how I continued working and um, yeah I've been in games almost 10 years now so yeah there's a lot to, a lot to talk about there and then obviously a little bit at the end about the studio there's so much to say about that that could probably be its own presentation as well but yeah I just wanted to talk about the foundations um, a little bit about the game and the fundraising and how we how we went about um, making it a reality basically. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about me for those of you that don't know me, which will probably be most, <laughs> most of you, I think. Um, I'm the CEO of Silent Games, um, as I mentioned, 10 years in the industry. The first kind of break I got in the industry, which I'll talk a little bit about later, is I was a playtester for Team 17. Now, that's not a full-time QA role. Um, basically, I used to go in, you know, once or twice a month to test the games and get feedback. Um, it was a voluntary position, but yeah, it was really good to have that on my CV. And that was the first kind of contact I had with the industry at all. Um, after that, um, after I finished uni, I got a job at Ubisoft. I worked for Ubisoft for six years um, in AAA, shipped loads of different titles, which I've got a little reel that I'm going to show you of um, some of the games that I've worked on. Hopefully a bunch of them will be familiar. Um, and then from there, I worked for three-ish years in independent game development. I worked at a VR and AR studio for a little while. Then I worked um, in indie publishing, a place called No More Robots, um, and worked with indie devs there on the publishing side. So I'll talk a little bit about that because people don't always um, know much about the publishing side of game development. But yeah, there's loads of interesting career paths in there as well. And from there, I've been at Silent Games full time. Um, so yeah. I'm going to be talking a little bit about that as well. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little reel of the games that I've worked on. And hopefully the sound works for you all. I really hope so. <laughs> Yeah, so hopefully that just gives a little kind of insight into the kind of games that I'm working on. I'm sure some of them will be familiar, like Just Dance, The Division, Watch Dogs, the big Ubisoft titles, and then some of the No More Robots titles as well. Um, lots of fun games to work on. And just a little bit about my, my background, really, as well. Like, I have always been interested in video games. I've always wanted to work in game dev. Uh, some of the first games that I ever played were Zelda and Pokemon. I'm sure there'll be a lot of fans of Zelda and Pokemon in the chat as well. So, yeah, Ocarina of Time was the game that I played, and I was like, this is... This is what I want to do, and I really want to work in game dev because I played played that game. So, yeah, it's always interesting to know what, what games inspired people to join game dev. So the first thing I kind of wanted to talk about before I go into the whole career journey is just a, a couple of things that a couple of attitudes really that I found useful and have found that have helped me in my career, and those two things are curiosity and also having a growth mindset. So. With curiosity, I am just a super nosy person. I'm always really interested in learning about what everyone's doing. Uh, when I worked in QA, uh, we had a lot of interaction 
sort of programming are and everything like that so I was always asking questions and that just helped me learn really quickly um, and yeah I definitely say don't be shy asking questions and just you know being a curious person that's that's how you learn and growth mindset ties into that really nicely as well and that's basically about not being afraid of failure not being frustrated by failure and certainly i don't embody that all of the time um but it is it is something that's really good to consider and there is an entire book about this which i will link at the end um about developing resilience in that way um so yeah i just wanted to mention those two because i think having the right attitude can get you a long way um aside from the details of doing the correct degree or finding your passion I do think that just having that curiosity and that ability to grow from you know a failed job interview or you know, you know something you've, you've messed up an exam and just moving on from that and doing better next time I think that kind of resilience is, is really important so I just wanted to mention that at the start in terms of university then um, I don't know if people are familiar with this chart, um, Ikigai, which means reason for reason for existing, reason for being. Um, and there are there is a lot of difficulty picking the right university course for you and deciding what actually fits what you want to do. And when I was thinking about it, I realized that I'd done basically this chart just as I worked through it in my own mind to decide what I wanted to do. So actually, I did uh, computer animation at uni. Um, that was because I was really interested in art, I was really interested in the technical side of things as well. And I thought that putting the two together would be something that would be perfect for me. Um, and I also, at the time, so bear in mind this was 10 years ago, I was trying to look for other game developers to talk to about, you know, what job roles were needed at the moment and all that kind of stuff. And trying to do all of that research um, to figure out what I was good at. So oh, I did pretty well at art, I did pretty well at IT, maybe I can mix the two. Uh, what you can be paid for, obviously, what roles are in demand are in, in the industry at the moment, what the world needs. So that's more like your, your mission and what you're actually really passionate about. Same with what you love. And if you can find a degree or a discipline that, that fits all of those for you, then that will probably mean that it's you're going in the right direction. And uh, you don't necessarily need to know it when you pick your degree. I wasn't entirely 100% sure that I would picked the right degree. Um, but just having that as a basis for making the decision, I, I think can be really useful if you're in that position. And to be honest, aside from university choices as well, it can be useful to figure out if you wanna have a career change or you wanna change jobs, or if you're not currently in the game industry and you're figuring out where you might fit in, this is a good thing to look at as well, I, I find. Um, so yeah, that's very useful. I also did um, a blog post about whether university is worth it or not. Um, because I think it is worth saying that I know a lot of people who don't have degrees who are thriving in the game industry and uh, a lot of people who have come from other career disciplines that haven't required a degree and moved to the game industry. So if you're someone that's in that position, I know it can feel quite quite stressful, like, oh, I don't have this requirement unless you're trying to move overseas or you're applying for a company that really does specify it as a necessity. There are plenty of places that will hire you based on your portfolio and your experience and how you perform in the interview over just having that degree. So yeah, I think it, it's worth mentioning and worth reassuring people about that just in case you're wondering whether or not it's worth it. And yeah, I did write a blog post about that. So um, I can share that at the end. I've got a, like a production blog that I write that just has tips about game production and other things really. Uh, um, and it just kind of goes through the detail of whether or not you should, you should go to uni and whether it, or not it's right for you. Um, so yeah, hopefully that seeing that's kind of useful for people and sparks a bit of, you know, oh, I haven't seen this before and I'm going to find this useful for deciding where I want to go. And then, as I mentioned earlier as well, just building your CV and portfolio, there's loads of different ways you can do that. And this could be, again, a presentation in itself. Um, but one of the things that I found really useful and something that really benefited me um, was getting industry experience via playtesting. Um, so playtesting is basically when a company wants you to come in, test the game as a player and give feedback as a player. It's usually unpaid, so obviously that's a, that's can be a barrier to entry for some people. So that that's that can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but it is really good because it's the first kind of protocol to get some industry experience on your CV. And when I applied for Ubisoft, I had that at the very top of my CV, even though obviously I had my degree in animation and a few other bits and bobs that I like voluntary stuff I'd done. Um, and they did ask me about my experience um, as a playtester at Team 17 
when I went for the interview, as well as loads of other things. Actually, in my interview, um, it was for Just Dance, and they made me <laughs> they made me dance to Rihanna's Disturbia. So in my interview, which I was totally not prepared for, even though I knew it was Just Dance. But uh, anyway, <laughs> hopefully you won't be asked to do that in an interview yourself. But uh, yeah, I, I found that really, really useful. Um, just having that little bit of experience and just having that contact with the studio as well. Um, being able to walk around and have a look at what a game studio looks like, knowing what to wear to an interview and all that kind of stuff. I just found that really useful. Um, usually AAA companies do this. So Ubisoft still does this, I believe, um, and some other studios. So if you are interested in picking up playtesting, then you can check out AAA Studios' Twitter. They normally post it on or their official website. They will normally do calls on there for playtesting experiences. Or to be honest, you could even reach out to indie studios that you admire um, because, you know, if they <laughs> don't have a big budget, maybe they'd want feedback from players. Beta testing and alpha testing is, is good as well. So, yeah, hopefully that helps if you're really struggling to get your foot in the door and get an internship, which are very competitive. Uh, yeah. So in terms of this is basically the start of my career path. This represents basically my six years at Ubisoft. So I just wanted to talk through that and the various roles that I went through because I feel like it'd be useful information for people who might be interested in some of the paths that are lesser known. Um, one of those being production. So um, as I mentioned, I started my career um, as a tester. So there's two different types of testing, which um, I, I don't know if people always know um, the difference, but basically there's functionality testing and development testing, and these are sometimes called different things. But essentially functionality testing is testing large parts of the game. You, you sometimes don't work directly with the developers. You're testing things after the changes have been implemented in the build. And so the aim of that is to get a broad picture of what the game is like and the functionality teams will usually be, be quite big whereas development testers they are very specific to a certain area of the game usually they will work they'll be basically embedded in the development team and they'll be checking things usually before it goes in the build or they'll be checking it after it's gone in the build but closely with the development team um, some types of testing places that don't have developers are just functionality only so getting a role there that, that means you're on the kind of path to QA whereas with development testing you'll get embedded in a specific team and it is quite if you're interested in you know being an artist or something like that it's good to be embedded in a team that um is working with the QA staff on that same team uh, hopefully that makes sense um so yeah I started as functionality and again as I mentioned that was on just dance so I was dancing a lot, <laughs> but also eating badly. So I wasn't any healthier, I have to say. Um, and from there, I moved into the role of development tester because I was interested in working more closely with the team. There was a requirement for a development tester. Um, there was a bit more um, like technically involved skills with development testing as well. So I just wanted to Im basically improve my skills and just see where I could go with that. Um, and at that point, in after I think I'd done testing for about a year and a half, I had a decision to make because um, a lead role came up for testing and I wasn't quite sure I would be ready for it at that time because it was quite, it was really early into my career. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, maybe I'll, I'll think about it a bit more. Maybe if it comes up again in the future, I'll, I'll consider that. But also people have been mentioning production to me as a role. And while I was working on Watch Dogs, one of the producers went on maternity leave and we had somebody else come in to cover for her, but they needed assistance going into that team. Um, and I'd been working with that team for a while at that point on Watch Dogs as a tester. So they gave me the opportunity to work alongside the new producer replacing her for a bit um, and just to get my skills up as in a production capacity. And I really, really enjoyed production. Um, so while I, while I was both doing testing and production at the same time and learning the ropes of both, a role then came up for a junior associate producer. No, I lie. A project coordinator. That's it. I've had loads of production, <laughs> production top titles. I forget which one. So yeah, a project coordinator role on Just Dance. So I really love Just Dance. I really loved working on it. And the role seemed like a really good entry level role for me to develop my skills and to learn what production was all about. So I internally applied for that role and then got the job. And that was where I was in production. So making that transition, making that career move and that decision point there. And um, I just it just felt right. And the team 
that I was working with felt that I would be good at it. So they gave me a lot of confidence and they recommended me to the management team, which was super nice of them. And yeah, I'm just grateful for their mentorship and their kindness just supporting me with that. So yeah, that definitely helped. And basically I've worked in production ever since. So it seems like it was a good choice for me. Um, and one thing to mention as well, obviously my degree was in computer animation. I decided that animation was not for me. Like I did okay in my degree and I was happy with like my degree result and everything, but like, I just decided that animation was just not my jam at all. So being in QA allowed me to see what opportunities there were in the studio at Ubisoft and assess where I felt like I fit in. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of what I was doing. Oh, we've got a lot of new people joining the chat. Hello. Oh, people from the USA. And Sarah says, go Sally. Thank you very much. Anna says this is useful as well. Thanks very much for encouragement while I'm trying as well. It's kind of hard when there's not people like talking back to you. So I appreciate the comment. Thank you for that um so yeah so continuing on my path then i basically at ubisoft moved up the ranks of production from project coordinator to junior associate to associate producer um associate producer at ubisoft i think the title is a little misleading it's quite a senior position um i was running a large team on the on the division at that point so my team was about i think it was between 40 and 50 people um when I was running the division and the way that was separated was you had different features to be in charge of. And at that point I had also um, some project coordinators working with me. So I was mentoring them and hiring new producers and, you know, training them as well. I just really liked my time in production at Ubisoft there. I learned a whole bunch from that and working on big projects. You can imagine there's a lot of moving parts there. Lots of people saying hello from all over the world. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, lots of moving parts. Um, but yeah, I, I learned a whole bunch. However, um, I was working at Ubisoft Reflections, which is a co-development studio, and they do a lot of work on some of Ubisoft's biggest games. But I also wanted to eventually, ultimately work on my own IP and work on my own games and build my own studio, which was my dream since I was a little girl, basically. Um, and because I'd been there for six years, I'd worked on the division for a number of years as well. And I was about to roll on to working on the division two. I was, I'd already did a bit of work on the division two, but I just felt like it was a good time to do something else. And that was the decision point, another decision point in my career where I was like, I've been in AAA for a while. It's been six years. I'm going to work on a similar project again. How much can I learn from this? And how do I further my goal of creating my own studio? I think it is time. So, um, yeah, that's that's six years, which is a good chunk of my career, to be fair. Um, but then I left Ubisoft and I went to a company that was called Hammerhead is now called Dimension and they work in AR and VR and I joined that company as a senior producer and again excellent learning experience um, because unlike AAA I had a very broad range of responsibilities so instead of being responsible for a very small chunk of the game even though it was a lot of people to manage um, I had a much broader um, responsibility and so I was defining production processes and all that kind of stuff and uh, working across the board on multiple projects at the same time, which was really good experience as well. Um, yeah. And just a lot of new learning experiences for me that I found super useful. The team was also great. I really loved working with the, the Dimension team. They're, they're a bunch of lovely people. I'm still friends with them now. So, yeah. And in that. So this was a, a period of two years. Um, AR was AR and VR was totally new to me. Again, that was another motivation for kind of doing this is to, to do something brand new. And over that two years, I also launched, launched Women Making Games. So Women Making Games is an organization based in the Northeast. It's very similar to Women in Games, except our focus is just, just the North. It started off as the Northeast, but we're branching out to, to the rest of the North a little bit as well, because people are just interested in joining. So we launched that to support women there. And a lot of uh, women from Ubisoft are in that. A lot of people from the previous companies that I've worked at. And we have a lot of students who are interested in learning about the industry industry getting mentorship and yeah we started building that we had a big launch party which was super cool lots of pizza it was very cool um and similarly along the same period of time i can't remember exactly when um i co-founded silent games uh with joseph um who i worked with at ubisoft and we started building the company while I was working full time. Um, Joseph did a lot of the work on, on the game concept and things like that. He worked on it full time while I was still working at Dimension and just building the brand of the studio as well. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about that later. Oh, we've got some comments. So Bianca, I'll, I'll answer your question at the end. And Adam, you're the best pal, I'll keep winning. Oh, thanks Adam. Adam's 
uh, our technical artist from Silent Games. So we've got the squad supporting, which is very nice. Thanks, Adam. Um, so yeah, uh, what, where was I? Oh yeah, so launched WOMB, started Silent Games, was a senior producer at, at Dimension, learning a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I went to the Venice Film Festival with the VR experience, which was the like out of this world. It was super, super cool. Um, so yeah, and then I really, we got to a point with Silent Games where Joseph had really almost wrapped up the game concept and we were at a point where we needed to start looking for investment to make a demo and working full time and trying to be involved in the company is it's tricky you you know and I was also running one and I, I had a hobbies as well and a life so as you can imagine it was a lot to try and do at once and it came to a point where I felt like it was time to take the risk and move on to something else that would allow me to spend more time on silent games but also give me experience in terms of publishing and knowing how to pitch to investors because i had literally no idea about investment no idea about budgeting just how to sell a game i had no idea and a role came up at no more robots which was part-time and it was in the world of publishing um i knew someone that worked there and he's a super nice guy so yeah i just felt like it was really good timing so bam like this was basically last year and I worked at No More Robots for a year as a senior producer as well in publishing and um, publishing is entire different side of the coin to game dev it's all about how the get how you're selling the game um, supporting the dev team supporting the dev team either with production processes um, funding um, development support localization QA all that kind of stuff um, and I thought I'm going to learn loads so you can probably see a trend in my career path which, which was evaluating at the point where I've learned everything that I might need to know at this company and well, where do I go to learn more stuff that I haven't done before um, so some of the stuff I was doing for No More Robots I was super comfortable with um, I'd done a lot of console submission stuff and that was part of my role at, um, at No More Robots but I was learning a bunch of how um, publishing works, how to get your game noticed on Steam, how, how I was seeing a lot of game pitches to No More Robots and I was developing my own pitch to pitch to other people. So that was super, super useful. And again, an amazing team at No More Robots. They're a bunch of really, really lovely people. So um, that was a great year. And I was working at No More Robots three days a week and I was working at Silent Games for free, by the way. I wasn't paid, <laughs> I wasn't paid for Silent Games because we didn't have investment at that point for two days a week. Um, yeah, and it just allowed me to further my goal of silent games, but also learn a bunch of publish publishing. And also I felt like I, I could really contribute um, to normal robots as well. So yeah, then at the end of the year, we, oh, one thing I will, I will explain all of the fundraising stuff um, in, in a couple of slides later, because that, that kind of feeds into this, but we got to the point where we really needed to go full on in terms of the investment and we were starting to talk to people and the conversations with people were getting really serious in terms of we might actually be getting investment for this and that means that um i can work on silent games full time and we can hire a team we can start making the game that we've always really wanted to make so yeah i was just getting really excited for that i realized that i'm running over a little bit so i'm, I'm i do apologize i'm gonna gonna try and wrap it up um but yeah, so that was my, oh, Rachel said it's okay. Awesome. Um, so yeah, that was my uh, pathway while I was at No More Robots. And then, um, yeah, so what I wanted to say about this is everything that I was trying to do at that point was all linked in some way. Um, I think it's pretty clear from what I've mentioned already that with silent games, um, and with no more robots the the two were helping each other so i was learning how to pitch to investors i was learning how to sell a game that fed into silent games and with silent games all of my business management kind of stuff all of my console submission experience was feeding back into no more robots same with the women making game stuff um that really helped because obviously we had candidate supply from that group. We had people who were mentoring me and who had done a budget before and could help me with things. And yeah, so I just wanted to say, like, if you are trying to figure out, should I start this organization? Should I join this organization? Should I be part of this company? Figure out what your ultimate kind of goal is. As I mentioned, that that ikigai, your kind of reason for being, figure out how those things link together so you can manage your time in an effective way. And everything that you're doing is contributing to, to the goals that you want to achieve. Um, obviously you can get to the point in that career where you can make those choices. Um, when I was, when it was very early, I was just like, I would take a job anyway. I just want to learn stuff. But then when you get to a point where you're trying to hit a specific goal, then definitely, um, consider 
the kind of activities that you're picking up. So in terms of silent games, then, as I mentioned, the timeline for this was we started with the studio, what we wanted the studio to mean. We started with the game concept as well, which Joseph worked on for a long time. Then we did our first round of fundraising, which was basically this is one of the barriers to, en uh, to entry for people, because um, a lot of the investors and publishers want a demo, but you can't get any, and you can't get any money without a demo. But where do you get the money to do a demo? It's very difficult um, if you if you're not rich <laughs> and if you are, don't have loads of money just to sit on. Um, so one of the things we did, we did a, a small fundraising round. And one of the things that really helped us was the UK Games Fund. So I don't know if people are familiar with the UK Games Fund, but um, that was really, really good. Apologies to people who are not from the UK. Some of this advice is going to be UK centric. Um, but they gave us some money to fund the demo. We also got some money from the coronavirus fund as well, because as you can imagine, we were just about to start the demo when the coronavirus stuff hit. That was not a good time. We were also doing freelance work. So we had a bunch of people working for us in a kind of an agency capacity. So we were doing freelance work to raise money to keep the company going as well. So yeah, all of that fed into um, feeding the demo creation because basically some companies will say, oh, it's not a requirement to have a demo, but it kind of is most of the time they do want to see a demo. So we used that money to make the demo and then we did fundraising round two. Uh, we spent like, a month or two talking to lots of different publishers and at the game industry business summit we met amplifier and they are the ones who invested in our company and now we are fully acquired by amplifier they are great people if you're interested in amplifier they have a great website that lists all the studios that they have acquired and are working with um and yeah so that means that yay i could quit my job and i can now work for silent games full time and we've got a team of amazing people now working on the rpg game you can tell that i'm very excited about this <laughs> um yeah because it was basically our, our dream since we built the studio and just to be able to concentrate on the game now and not being being on the fund, funding treadmill um, it's a super cool place to be. And we did have a round of hiring as well a couple of months ago. We'll have another round of hiring in a few months time. Um, so yeah, we do have a programming role available as well. Very friendly and nice people. So feel free to apply for that program, programming role if you're interested. And yeah, that's where we're at with silent games. So yeah, as I mentioned, I've talked a little bit about silent games already. This is just the marketing spiel for it. Um, but yeah, we founded it in 2018. It's a double A studio. So it's halfway between, um, oh, Adam says we are super nice, I hope. Yes, Adam, we are nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, double A studio. So that's basically between indie and triple um, A. It's not super small, like one or two people, but it's a uh, you know, not like other people. And yeah, we have a, a new IP in development. We're planning multiple games across a kind of an RPG universe. And we're working on our first game now, which is super exciting. And again, the team are working really hard on that. So yeah, um, that's pretty much my entire entire journey. And um, Sam says, if you pick up the program and well, you'll be working with me. Sam's great. Thumbs up to Sam. And Jonathan says, this is great info. Thank you. Oh, y'all are nice. Thanks. Um, so yeah, that is pretty much my entire career journey. I hope that was useful for everybody. And Rachel's here now to, to ask questions in the Q&A. So. All right. So, um, Sally, do you mind just closing down your presentation for me? Oh, yeah, there you go. All right. Hello, everybody. So I'm Rachel <laughs> from Women in Games. I've been in the chat listening. So, Sally, first of all, thank you. That was unreal. Yay, thanks. <laughs> so, I mean, I think part of the great thing about putting on these careers events is just how good it is to hear about other people's experiences. I just think mm. like, we don't, it, there's not enough of it. And I suppose mm. having these sorts of virtual events allows us to share stories. So mm. yours is obviously fantastic. Um, and like I said, it, it's been a, it's just, you know, you've jumped around in different roles. So there's a few different yeah. questions that have come in. I'm going to deal with the straight up one that came in early on, which is when you look for producers, would you look for external certificates like APM and Prince 2? So if you could just answer that one first. Personally, no. Um, that's just me. I just find in the game industry, you usually use agile or scrum methodology, basically. So if you can get qualifications in that, some people might find that useful. I have heard in the US, those kind of qualifications are more important. And also, if you are struggling to get an internship or something, it might be worth the investment. But I know that those courses are very, very expensive. And a lot of the material is available online already. So it depends if you, you know, if you've saved up and you really think that it'll help benefit your experience, I wouldn't say don't do it. But at the same time, 
I look for more than that when I look for a producer and I don't necessarily need those qualifications when I'm hiring myself. And I know that a lot of other studios don't. AAA can be a bit more picky about um, qualifications than indie usually, um, because you, indie usually focuses on portfolio. It, that's a bit of a generalization, but you know, it, AAA get hundreds of applications. Sometimes they filter people out. Um, so yeah, I, I guess, yeah, that's my answer. It's kind of like, it depends, All but right. usually, you know, not, not worth the thousands of pounds they normally cost. All right. And I've got, I've, there's been a couple of questions around starting a business and obviously, mm -hmm. um, like how you deal with the risks, um, and also, you know, the potential negativity that people, I suppose, can give you because of those risks, but how you push through that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's notable is obviously there's a lot of financial risk to it. And I'm not, you know, I come from a working class background. I don't have, you know, connections to anybody. When I started the game industry, I didn't have any connections at all. So it is a kind of a scary financial risk, which is why I had that security blanket of having a full time job. Well, a part time job at, while working at Silent Games because I was having that regular income. Um, there's always a risk with starting a business that you have to accept at some point and you ha you do have to roll the dice at some point as well um, and just to accept that risk. But obviously getting a safety net as much as you can financially can ease some of that pressure. Not that it goes away fully because <laughs> it never really does. But um, yeah, I think uh, that obviously there's a lot of positives to taking that risk in the end if it works out for you. And um, it did for us, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of like, there's a few different questions coming through. Um, one is about considering involving people with not that much experience, like interns, and then also mm -hmm. what is a junior position to become a producer in your opinion? Um, so in terms of internships, I think we're really keen on having interns at Silent Games. We have a partnership with Teesside University where we have got interns in before. One of the interns that we had um, for a few weeks is now one of our full-time employees. And he was the first person we ever hired at Silent Games. So obviously there's there's benefits as a company for us to hire interns and there's huge benefits for the interns themselves as well. Um, obviously paid internships are really important and that can help you learn. It gets you first your foot in the door. Um, I'm seeing more internships now. When I started, internships just really weren't a thing. Um, but again, like I said, that was 10 years ago now. There's a lot more out there, which I'm glad to see. Um, so yeah, definitely get involved in internships if you can. And in terms of the junior position, the problem with production is like a lot of the job titles are really, really different depending on the company. So some of the junior titles will be like junior producer, junior associate producer, project coordinator, project assistant. Those are normally the junior roles. So as you can see, there's already four there. There's probably like way more than that. Um, but yeah, um, I would recommend looking at all of those job roles that I've just mentioned to find where you, where you go and usually when you're looking on a website for jobs like a triple a company or an indie company they'll categorize things by production so you can just look at the full production category and you can see whether or not that sounds like it's an entry level role because it's not always super clear with production um, just had a so, question yeah. come in about graduate schemes or do you have graduate schemes so we do with Teesside specifically, it's something that we're going to explore in the future just because um, I know how hard it is to get that first contact in the industry because I was, uh, you know, I'd be, I was messaging tons of developers and no one was applying. It was really hard to get my foot in the door, which yeah. is why I recommended play, play testing. Um, but yeah, it's something that we're going to look at because I, I would love to do that at some point. And so, yeah, it'll, if we do that, it'll be on our website, <laughs> Silent Games. So. Yeah. And I suppose um, that's a thing as well about people figuring out what, people are good at and what their skills are um mm -hmm. and and how people know like when there's all these different sorts of jobs and you obviously got that great experience of moving through and working at ubisoft and and kind of feeling that out i mean and so i suppose is how do you recommend people can figure out what they're good at i suppose yeah i think that i used my time at university to try a lot of different things like um so my university course even though it was animation the lecturer let me attend all of the games course stuff as well i was attending a lot of lectures and i was also working at mcdonald's so it was a lot of, it was a lot of work to figure that out but at the same time just having i got to do like a concept art module which i really did love concept art i'm no good at drawing anymore I'm out of practice. Um, I got to do an the animate like the animation modules on my course. I got to do game design modules. So you need to try everything to see if it fits you. But at the same yeah. time, at one point you need to specialize because one of the difficult things and one of the main problems I see in student portfolios is they are too widely spread. 
So they'll have 3D art, they'll have concept art, they'll have life drawing all in the same portfolio and they'll all be okay, but not amazing. So that's one of the things that you have to avoid a little bit as well is trying everything, but then at one point focusing down and finding your passion, finding your needs. And you can always change it. Like I said, my degree, I finished it. It was in animation, didn't even touch animation ever again. So there is opportunities for figuring it out later as well. I don't want people to feel like I have to know right now exactly what I'm going to do. Because um, right, one, <laughs> one last question for you before we wrap it up, which is the big one that somebody <laughs> asked earlier, but how do we get more women in games? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's so many different things that need to happen, like in terms of getting women into to games in general, obviously mentorship has a big impact. Um, I had a really great university lecturer that made a big difference to me um, and just having her there to ask stuff and just be like, what's what is the industry really like? I, I You know, and getting that impression of it beforehand helps a big deal. And um, stuff like this is really good as well. You can meet other women who are trying to do the same thing as you and you can have that support network of peers. Um, and then the second part really is creating an atmosphere where women feel welcome, where your gender is irrelevant to proceedings. You're just making what the games that you want to make and it's not anything that ever comes up in conversation. I think that's the point at which we'll know we've done a good job um, because obviously we have a lot of women, more, a lot more women joining, but in terms of women staying in the industry, it can be tricky. There's problems with obviously uh, overtime and crunch and just having a sustainable career for everybody, not just women. Um, all those conversations are, are happening at the moment. So yeah, mentoring can help you join, but it can help you stay. Um, and just finding a company that matches you obviously i always recommend taking taking any job at first but then you'll get to a point where you're experienced enough to know where you're going to learn the best and what company values fit with you and where you feel comfortable with the people around mm. you and later you can start making those decisions and you're you start interviewing them while you're on an interview to see if it's the right yeah. thing for you at this point. Yes. So, and I like to think that that you know, come like organisations as a concept is under a bit more scrutiny nowadays in terms of you know, like I said, it's a two way street as well. There's yes. more mm -hmm. uh, um, pressure. I would like to think on bigger organisations to be good enough for employees is the other way around. Yes, uh, I agree. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> but you've got to think about what makes your studio a nice place to be. Like we thought very carefully about like our benefits package like how many holidays we're going to have. We have like a fitness and well-being allowance. We have healthcare and dental and all that kind of stuff. And just thinking about that hopefully says to people, we thought about you and how well you're going to be. And I, yeah, look for things like that when you're applying for a studio and you'll know that it's probably okay. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, well, I want to wrap it up now. So um, there's lots of wonderful comments, Sally. So thank you again so much.